Well, this is a, a fun treat for everybody, hopefully, over there at La Traditioner, uh, Traditional Archery Society. This is Scott Dobbs uh, with my grandfather, Donald Dobbs, who many of you know or uh, was best friends with the, the legend, the one and only Howard Hill, and he agreed to sit here and talk to you guys for a little while. But I know there was a few people on the forums that had a couple of questions for him and everything. And, among him, just talking about Howard Hill, we'll try to cover some of those. Uh, Donald, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit to everybody? Uh, yes, I'm Donald Dobbs. I met I met Howard Hill. I guess it was probably around early 1960, 62 or 63. I had been hunting in uh, wildlife management area in uh, East Alabama the Chakalaka management area where a lot of the Georgia bow hunters came to hunt. And they was telling me that Mr. Hill was in Wilsonville visiting his sister, uh, Mamie Hill. She was a, uh, an old maid school teacher. And so I went over and met him. And then I met him again I guess in 1964, he did a exhibition in Birmingham at uh, one of the sports show, the boat show, where they did uh, advertising boats and then archery and other sporting equipment. And he told me at that time he was coming back to Alabama. And uh, so I guess it was, I don't remember just exactly the year, but 1966, he was building his home there in Vincent, Alabama, near where we, uh, he and I organized the first Creek Archery Club range and set it up. And he ordered my first Howard Hill longbow, uh, back quiver, air, the whole works, the whole Howard Hill thing from Shawnee Sports in California. That's where their company was at that time. And then, uh, then uh, later on, the Eakin family, Ted Eakin, bought the Howard Hill uh, archery from Mr. Hill and, and uh, uh, Jim Darling and several others that made the bows. And then later on, John Schultz started building his bows. John and his brother, uh, can't remember his name just right off. Anyway, John's brother later died. But anyway, Mr. Hill took them under his wing and taught them everything about archery. And I would say, uh, I know John's older than I am now, but I would say they could duplicate most any kind of a shot that Mr. Hill made. I know John, even his sons grew up learn and learn how to shoot uh they could hit an aspirin thrown up into the air i don't care if it was how far away it is that doesn't wouldn't make any difference I like i'd like to see some of you shoot an aspirin out of the air if it's five feet <laughs> but anyway he did yeah, i'll be lucky to hit a broadside and, and, of a barn <laughs> uh, it was just it was just uh, john schultz was just an extra or i met him and but i never did see him actually shoot other than his film that I, I have of him but uh, which everybody we have a uh, a lot of Howard Hill memorabilia that my grandfather has saved over the years and everything and we'll take a look at some of those after little interview and after uh, Donald gets through talking and everything uh, so there was one question uh, you pretty much covered one question uh, about how did you get started in archery and everything so, but uh, you want to elaborate a little bit longer on like so when you started with Howard Hill and everything, uh, how did you get into it really heavy? Did you start off into it deep and start shooting and learning with him pretty quickly right off the bat? Or did you have to, uh, did you kind of like, were you kind of uneasy about starting it and everything? Well, as I said, we started, I learned about more about him whenever we hunted in the Chocolaca management area, just East Alabama, where a lot of the Georgia bow hunters. But to begin with, after Mr. Hill and I, we started and organized the, the Creek Archery 
arranged and set it up in 1967. Well, by then, I had been shooting in tournaments with lightweight recurve tournament equipment. And by then, I'd already gotten into some real bad shooting problems. And uh, something, my wife, Lanice, at that time, uh, she shot left-handed. So one day I took her left-handed bow and shot it left-handed and the problem went away. I could shoot good. <laughs> <laughs> so I started shooting left-handed. But anyway. Uh, what exactly were the problems that you had? Was the, they call it target panic. It's a psychological thing. It's in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do the right you can't go through the right motions and the functions. You shoot too quick or not quick enough, or just real, you don't have any. You don't have any mental and physical controls over your shooting, but just real ch antsy and changing over, ready to get trigger happy. Changing that kind of over thing. completely. <laughs> then I started back shooting right-handed, and it started all over again. But I could shoot either way. And and another thing people don't know about Howard Hill, everybody told me says you can't do that because you've got to shoot with your dominant eye. My right eye is dominant. Mr. Hill's left eye was dominant, but he shot a bow right-handed. So I, I learned through reading, most of the time when you shoot a recurve or a long bow, you can't the bow. And what it does, it brings everything center focus to the middle. Now, I like shooting a high-powered rifle or a, a, a bow with scopes and sights on it, you shoot it like that, and and you've got to. You really need to shoot with your dominant eye. Right. But I've had Mr. I've had him to argue with me. Mr. Hill could not shoot that way, as good as he could shoot. Well, he did. And so that, that was something that I guess most people don't know that he was left eye dominant, but he shot right handed. Now he shot a shotgun left handed. <laughs> He's because, just proving everybody wrong. But, I mean, he, or a rifle, he shot a rifle left-handed because he used his dominant eye if it was shooting a rifle. But there were so many things, if you could get it all together, that he was quite unique in doing. So I, uh, unless somebody progged my memory, I, I, I can't think of it just right off. But. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, uh, a user on this forum called Ugly Coyote. And one of the questions he came up with is, uh, no, I'm sure you did, but did you go on any hunts with Howard Hill? And if if you did, what was it like hunting with an absolute bow hunting legend? Do you, I'm sure you have some uh, quite a few interesting <laughs> stories to tell for something like that. Well, of course, whenever you hunt, you, you're not you're not right there with them, you know? right? But, but we well, everyone we, automatically assumes when you go hunting with somebody or anything, you're used, shoulder used, to shoulder. <laughs> we did sleep in the same bunkhouse and, and hunted on the same area. We hunted in a little place in Georgia called Uvalda, Georgia. Uh, it's not too far from Vidalia, Georgia, I think, and it's right on the Altamaha River. Right on the Altamaha River, and this was back, I can't even remember what year it was, but they were always picking at him about. You can't shoot a, a recurve, or you can't shoot, oh, by the way, he called a compound bow a contortionist. <laughs> he said, that's a contortionist bow. But he he said, uh, and they were just kidding him about it. So we were standing outside the, the bunkhouse, and he said, let me have that contortionist bow. And, and he grabbed off somebody's hat and, and, and throwed it up in there, and he shot a hole in that boy's hat with that contortionist bow said I don't care what kind of bow it is if it's a bow and arrow I can shoot it I bet that's I bet that's a hat that's worth some money right now if somebody still even, got it if, if it'd been my hat I, I, well I wouldn't still have it because all my memorabilia burn up in December the 30th 1985 so everything that I had of his I had a whole box of die barred feathers from the Michigan Feather Company, which no, it's probably been out of business for many, many years, but all that burned up and his, his feather burner and, and everything, that I, a lot of stuff, memorabilia I had of his burning, pictures, oh, pictures, pictures, 
I had boxes of pictures, but there's a lot of stuff gone. I don't have, I don't even have a, a, a Howard Hill broadhead anymore. I, I sent Peter Day in England just about all of my Howard Hill memorabilia. So uh, all I have is pictures. I have some pictures and things like that, but I don't have any anything directly from him. I remember one year after he came to Alabama, there was some United States big dignitary uh, organization wanted him to come to Washington or somewhere like that to do some shooting for him. And he, he said, I didn't care nothing about it. He done, said, I've done been shooting all my life. I don't care nothing about shooting. And, and, uh, he's, he said he wasn't going to do it for nothing. So they offered him some money and he said, he, he told him what he would do it for. He didn't ever tell me what the amount was, but he said, they come up with the money. And he he said, uh, ask me what I build a bow string for him. He had taught me how to do the Flemish splice on, and make a bow string for his, the bow that he wanted to. And he told me how many strands to put in it. Just He wanted it just exactly the way he did it, but he's like my hands are now. They didn't work so good with that twisting. I made the string for him, and it was fine. Uh, did the serving, and I said, where do you want me to put your knocking point? He says, you don't worry about the knocking point. That's a little bit too personal. I'll put my own <laughs> knocking point on. <laughs> He's got his own way of doing yeah, things. Yeah, he had a certain way, certain way. And by the way, he didn't knock under the knocking point like most of us do. He knocked on top of the knocking point. He said when he come out of his quiver and, and, and slid that, in a hunting uh, exercise, he would just slide that knock right on top of that. And otherwise, the other way, you'd have to try to wiggle it around and find it and slide it up on it and all. And he said it just was much easier for uh, hunting. Right. So he, he just had a lot of little unique things was different that he don't he did that we don't do. Um, earlier, just a few minutes ago, you were telling me about a... Uh... A little boar hunting uh, thing that happened. You want to tell everybody about what happened there? Well, I've got uh, on that about whenever he took that contortionist bow. Well, uh, this little place was in in Uvalde, Georgia. A uh, bunch of our club members in the Creek Bow Hunter Club. Uh, we all went over there and we spent I don't know how many days, but we didn't get a. He didn't get a boar, and I didn't get a boar, but I also been deer hunting with him. And then I've hunted, uh, let's see, then I hunted in, uh, wh where was it? Janice Leo's hunting in, in Georgia. I bow, uh, hog hunted in Valdosta, Georgia with him. And he was up in a, he was up in a, a tree stand. They had it set up, you know, pretty good. He got up in there. I don't know how he got up in it, but he was in a tree stand and he was, uh, overlooking a, a drainage ditch and I was walking down that ditch and I guess everybody else did because there was so many deer tra I mean hog tracks in that ditch and and I, I walked up and that Mr. Hill was up in that tree stand I said Mr. Hill have you seen any hogs he said no but I've seen a, a zillion hog hunters <laughs> <laughs> but everybody would hit that drainage ditch would see all them tracks and they said Man, I know where these hogs are going. I'm going to follow these hogs. And everybody's just and following that, and behind whenever them. Whenever they got to, there Mr. Hill was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, did you have any, uh, did you have any really, uh, I guess, uh, stressful or, like, you know, close calls whenever you went hunting with Howard Hill that he may have told you or something? Like, did that maybe the target that just got away or just barely got away, you know, it, it's probably the trophy buck that he probably came across. Well, he told me about, uh, I, I was showing you those pictures where that, where he had a, a wild hog strapped to his back and, and he told me about a hog that he had shot and I have, I, I have a picture, some pictures, movie pictures of the hog head and has his Howard Hill broadheads and how it penetrated the, the bone and everything. But anyway, he was telling me, he sh this hog come out of the palmetto bushes, and he was facing it, and he shot, and the hog lunged, and it went kind of through his jaw and into his 
that armor plating in his shoulder and didn't it, it didn't hurt just all he did made him mad as a dickens. And he said that that some gun took off after him and he couldn't get an arrow out in time. And he said that thing got so close that he, he could make up a story and make it pretty a lot of flour. It, it might it might not have been true, I don't know, but it was good. It was a good pro a story that he told. He says that thing got so close that his tusk hooked my belt loop and said, I gained on that hog and I was able to get an arrow out and 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 it and that arrow in that hog head evidently that was the one that hit him right straight directly in between his eyes and dropped him right in his tracks. Yeah, I know most people would be extremely nervous in that kind of situation and probably don't have the wits about them to perform like that. Let you know with a gun, not even a gun, nevertheless a bow. You know that's that just speaks to his uh, performance. Well, he was just looking for a tree to climb. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but anyway, those places where we hunted in Georgia, it was in those. It was all pines, and every every place looked just exactly the same. Where they would uh, they would uh, tap those trees and get that turpentine, and so every. Everywhere you went, old palmetto bushes and, and, and drainage ditches and pines. And it's easy to get lost in that place. Easy. Yeah, that's that's most of the voids around here, too. They look all the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was one user that had a, a magazine called Hunting the Hard Way, in which in the 1984 World Longbow Championships, both you and Howard Hill signed his magazine and a lot of other people that were there as well and everything. Are there any kind of, is there anything that you can remember about the 1984 World Longbow Championship or anything interesting about any kind of other championships you may have been in? Well, I know that Jim Belcher from England uh, <coughs> came and shot, uh, I think that was the first one that anybody from actually out of the United States came and shot. And, and uh, best I can remember, he was shooting his English longbow. And, uh, and by the way, Peter Day from England sent me an English longbow that one of his friends made uh, there in England. And also they sent me a replica of one of the old English uh, arrows with the bodkin type point on it. I've got it in, in there and I was gonna show uh, Scott after a while. But uh, it just, like I said, I don't have hardly any memorabilia anymore. I gave Peter Tate most of everything because I, felt kind of obligated because he sent me that English longbow and uh, in fact I shot it in in the longbow tournaments a good quite a bit and it, it was really a lot of fun to shoot it's different different it don't have the speed and everything as uh, like the the new longbows that we shoot nowadays but it, it, was, it was a lot of fun to shoot all right we had to take a brief pause uh my camera can only get, do a few minutes at a time, but Donald here had a story about shooting at a uh, school that he'd think everybody would love to hear about. Also, we might want to say, I said, uh, Jim Belcher a while ago when it was actually Jack. Yep, yep, yep. His, his, uh, Jim's daddy was from England. Yep, so that one's for you, uh, Mr. Belcher. <laughs> mm. All right, so... About this school function that you were telling me about. Well, you know, Mr. Hill made the full-length film in Africa in 1950 called Timbo, about a 90-minute. It was all action. And uh, by the way, you can take that sometime and look at it. But whenever a group would want Mr. Hill to do the shooting or, or talk or show his film, he would get the group at the Creek Bow Hunters Club to narrate it and do whatever we wanted to do or whatever the the group wanted us to do but he didn't do the shooting himself so uh, at this private school i decided i would do uh, one of the fancy things like he did and i had been practicing shooting the flame out of a candle and i don't know how many feet it didn't make any difference how many feet it was away uh, if you can shoot it out, you can shoot it out. But I could, outside, I could shoot that thing and it, and it just, if I got close, the feathers would blow it out. My fletchings would blow the candle out. 
So I thought, well, you know, that won't be a big deal. So we set that thing up in the auditorium. And uh, Mr. Hill had Mr. Hill had told me, says, now, anytime you're doing any kind of expo exposition, uh, what you call it? Uh, uh, exposition? Mm -hmm. Expedition, uh, <laughs> shoot, and any kind, any of, kind of show. <laughs> if you're putting on the show for somebody, if you mess up, don't let them know you're messing up. Just tell them, just make it look like part of the show. So, sure enough, we turned off all the lights and couldn't, couldn't see anything but the candle glowing. And I, I bared down on that thing. I said, man, I got this. And I shot that candle. I thought it went out. I thought it went out. It laid that flame down, and I started to tell them to cut the lights back on, but the flame came up, and I said, strike one, <laughs> turn the lights on. I said, whew, I've got to get closer to that wick on that thing. So on the second shot, I drawed down on that thing. I said, i got to get close. It laid that thing down, and it, it looked like it was laid down for a minute, but it didn't. <laughs> It come back up. The lights come. I said, strike two, turn the lights on. I said, self, you're going to have to either shoot that candle, knock it down, or you're going to have to shoot the wick plumb out of that candle. You're going to have to do something different. This is strike three. So I draw back on that thing, and I, I laid down on it real good and shot that thing, and, it, and I said, strike three. You're out. It didn't come back up. I was so grateful, and I remembered what Mr. Hill said. Strike three, and you're out, and it was out. I said, turn the lights on. And what was so funny, I, I couldn't figure out what made the difference, but I looked at that candle after the show was over, and it looked like you just took an arrow and laid in on, that, on top of that wet, hot wax, and that wick was just laying down in the same direction that arrow's going, and it was just a groove where that arrow had hit actually a little bit below the base of the candle, and it, it, it and it was a strike three. And, and another little trick that we did, uh, Scott's daddy, Steve, the boys wore their hair a little bit longer, and he found an old mannequin head that we, and, uh, and then he got a wig and we got a little platform and we told people, said, now we're gonna put him behind this platform and we're gonna put an apple on his head and we're gonna shoot the apple off his head, but we don't want his full body showing because, you know, anything could happen. And, and you know, we just, we just want to try to make it safe as possible. And I didn't even think about, it. it'd be bad enough to shoot his head off, <laughs> to miss the apple and shoot his head off. But anyway, we did that trick and and two or three of us made the shot and shot the apple and we put another apple or if it didn't shoot it too bad, we put the same apple back on it. And then after the whole program was over and after Mr. Hill showed his uh, film, Timbo, after, and people was asking questions and everything, some of the youngsters that went to the school, they went over there looking where we had the platform and, 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 and Steve behind it. They said, they didn't really shoot that off his head. They found that old mannequin and that, uh, wig but we we did some crazy things some funny things and, and uh, mr hill was he was great about telling us how to do a lot of that or we wouldn't have known how to done anything but it turned out good so uh, i know everybody most everybody that knows howard hill knows about his uh how accurate he was with a longbow, you know, including, you know, shooting an aspirin out of the air from however many feet away, which no one, hardly anybody can just shoot an aspirin that's sitting still, let alone if it's thrown in the air like a skeet. Yeah. Uh, what if, were there any other kind of really interesting or really difficult tricks that he could pull off that he might have been famous for as well? Well, I, I saw some of the films. Let's see. He shot a... He shot an eagle out of a tree from 150 yards, I believe it was. And another time, and it's, this is all in the, some of the magazines and books that you can read it. Uh, it was the last day of elk season. The elk was way up on a hill, and just the sun going down, just a, just a, like a picture, like a picture. He shot 
over the elk. It's about 185 steps after it was over that they stepped it off. He shot over it. And then the second shot, he shot under it. The elk still standing there, but he got it with the third shot. So just he was just, he knew where his shots were going to hit, but that was 185 yards. And he had to do a little calculating. It took him three shots to get that one. That's, and that reminded me about the strike three and you're out <laughs> deal. Uh, where was this at? It was, uh, this might have been in Yellowstone Park. Back. He said they would, there was times that they'd slip in there when they were young in Yellowstone Park because there's so much game in, back in. I'm not sure where it was. And it, it could have been in Montana, but I don't know. It's in one of the publications that he, that he wrote about. And, but talking about shooting things out of the air, he would usually start off with a silver dollar and half dollar quart, quarter and a nickel and then a dime and, and get small. But I mean, that was just what he did in most, in all of his shooting programs. It just, he'd start off with a little bit larger ones and then sometimes shoot the wooden disc. When he shot in 1964 in Birmingham at that boat show, sports out, outfit, well, he had busted a about a four inch wooden disc that they'd uh, thrown up and some that he'd rolled across the floor and, and I picked it up and he signed it for me. And I, of course, I lost that in, my, in the, when my home was burned in, in 1985. I, like I said, I lost a lot, a lot of memorabilia that would have been worth a lot to me. Oh yeah. With his, his, sign, his signature. A lot of people has tried to copy his signature and a lot of times on the, some of the bows that was made back years ago, he didn't sign them, actually, but someone else signed them for him, and they made the signature as close like his as he could. But that was his signature because, oh, yeah. because I saw him when he did it. There's hardly, barely any of those probably left over. <laughs> Not. And then my book, that I lost it in the fire, too. He signed it. Unless you ask me a particular question, I you know I can't just take it off the top of my head. But no, I, I think there was a there was one picture that I know you showed me. I don't know if it's sitting around here or anything, but it's either uh, it's either you or Mister Mister Hill, and y'all look like y'all are about to go into it like a roly poly roll, and you have a bow propped up on, up underneath you like you're upside down and make the make shots and everything. Where those some of the were those some of the standard kind of trick shots that y'all would have in any kind of little show you'd have? You say you saw that picture? Yeah, I saw that picture somewhere. I don't know where it is. We oh. did. We used to go down and uh, camp smile a mile for little youngsters that had uh, cancer. And we would take little plastic, little fiberglass bowls and, and try to let them shoot and learn how to shoot. And they they would hold it <laughs> in all kind of ways, and, and there's one of them I did stand on my head and trying to you know and, and trying to shoot and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know if that's the one you saw or not. I, I think it may have been. It, it can't but, smell my but, but we would go down there every year just to uh, to entertain those youngsters that had cancer, and and sometimes the next year that child that we met wouldn't be there, so. Uh, I'm sure they appreciated it either way, the little yeah, fun that they could have. The lady that kind of <coughs> organized that thing, she had to give it up. She couldn't ha she couldn't handle not seeing those kids the next year, some of them. So. We, we've done a lot of stuff in archery. I've got one, I've, I made, uh, I was looking in my films, that, that I, and I, I remembered we did bow fishing. We were out near the paper mill here in Childersburg, and I had just, and those, the scales on, on those uh, gar are pretty sharp, and, and they're, the teeth on their snouts are pretty sharp. Well, I had shot one, uh, one probably, I don't know, probably four or five feet long. I had shot it, 
and it rolled and twisted and cut my line. Well, I always carried an extra bow fishing arrow with me, and so I, I tied up another one and, and maybe shot some more fish. I can't remember, but after a while, that fish that I had shot looked like a submarine coming up. <laughs> it come up to the top. You can see my arrow, and, and I shot that booger, and I got him and my arrow back, so that was, and I got, I had someone to, and I think I've got it on film. I, I was looking at my film a while ago. Uh, if I can get some of those copied, that'll be good. And But I did get a, 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 I'm pretty sure I got that episode on film. And, but that was unique for, for uh, to get the same fish that you'd shot. And you, it, we thought it went to the bottom and that was it. But submarines will come back to the top and that one did. Yeah, he just put up a fight and finally again did. <laughs> <clears throat> what was the biggest, uh, if you can remember, what was the biggest scar that you ever got all bow, uh, bow hunting, or the biggest fish, really? Uh, now we we used to shoot what they used to what they call red horse sucker fish, and me and your daddy and, and Randy and, and your, your nanny, she would uh, we would get in in these little branches where they the fish would come out of the big waters into the just like salmon do, they were spawning. And at that time of the year, they're, they're real, real good flavored fish, but they got a little hair bones in them. You have to learn how to kind of fry, uh, fry those and crisp those bones away. But we have got big sackfuls. There's just so many of them, and, and we'd give them to people. But they, uh, we enjoyed that bow fishing because a lot of action there, a lot of action. You'd get a lot of shots. Oh, yeah. Get a lot of misses, too. Oh, yeah. But there's a lot of shots, <laughs> and it was fun. <coughs> Will those fish get particularly big? Oh yeah, they'll get they'll get you know a, a red horse sucker will get you know fifteen to twenty pounds some of them will. But now those gar, they'll get up to to hundred pounds. And uh, uh, Floyd Oaks lived in Louisiana at that time. He sent me a picture. I believe that one was one he shot was over a hundred pounds, and he was out in a boat when he shot it. And of course, when it died, it went to the bottom, and he had to paddle and dragging it on the bottom. But I, I believe it went over a hundred pounds. I've got, I, I think I've got a picture of it in my some of my stuff. Uh, but the, those those uh, gar all get real big. Oh yeah, and that's why a lot of people are encouraging if you go for gar fishing, especially for those big alligator gars. They uh, they tend to ask you to do catch and release just because the big ones are getting haunted out so much that they're not they're not getting enough time to get big enough anymore and everything so the hundred pounders and everything are getting more and more rare especially around texas yeah well this this was in louisiana at the time when he lived in louisiana so i guess that was down in the alligator country i don't know mm -hmm. well uh, i guess this is the last segment a little part three um I've got plenty of pictures of some other articles and memorabilia that he has that I was going to show you guys later on in the video and everything, but once you guys see this video, please, by all means, if you have any more questions or anything, please feel free to let me know on the forums. I'll probably make another post announcing this video and everything, and if you got any more questions for him, you can definitely let you go. Uh, Donald, is there anything you'd like to say before we leave? Well, this Howard Hill episode started... I mentioned earlier, back in the early 60s, 62 or 63, I suppose, and then ended when his life ended in 1975. And uh, as we was looking at pictures, you saw the pictures of the last time the known recording of Mr. Hill pulling a longbow was, I believe, well, I don't, I'm not going to give the dates because I think it was in August of 74. <clears throat> and he had just come out of the hospital, but he had strength to pull. And I don't know whose bow it was, but it, you know, probably a 50-something pound bow, but he pulled it just like it wasn't nothing. And, and then he'd had some bad health problems, uh, colon cancer and things like that. But anyway, his life ended in... Uh, 1975 and uh, that 
kind of, you know, it, it didn't kill the sport, but the one that made the sport famous was gone, so we carried on the best we could and still enjoy the finding out stories. And we, I've got clippings and clippings and clippings of stories that other uh, archers and uh, authors have uh, wrote about Mr. Hill. There's a, a lot of people uh, loved him and knew him and they wrote about him. But then there's a lot of people that was fans of Howard Hill that never met him. But I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with him, sitting on his Elon skin couches and chairs uh, that he killed whenever he was in Africa in 1950, filming Tembo. And, uh, as you know, he was the first white man to ever kill an elephant with a bow. And uh, I'm sure it's in print, but the bow that he used pulled about 120 pounds at his draw length of, of 28 inches. He could have pulled 30 inches very easily, but the way he shot with that kind of crook elbow and relaxed elbow, he only pulled, the reason he pulled just 28 inches, he said it was hard back then in the early years to get an arrow spined stiff enough for those heavy bows to shoot. So the longer the arrow is, it's like a, a, a railroad. That's the reason they can bend those railroad irons and go around a curve. The longer they are, the easier they are to bend. But they that long, like to see you bend one that long. But, uh, the, you know, the, you guys know the stove there. They have to be a certain spine to, to end up hitting where you want it to hit. So that was the reason that he only shot a 28-inch draw. Sometimes his arrows would be longer. You know, the one that he killed the elephant with was about 31 inches longer or 41 inches maybe I can't remember the length of it but it was extra heavy extra heavy built and the broadhead was extra heavy built so uh, quite an extraordinary man with extraordinary strength that excelled in baseball football and more so in archery than any other person that I ever knew of so we'll uh, kind of end the story there and we'll pick it up later when Scott has time and comes back and, and you guys have more questions. Uh, I've got a lot of answers, but I can't get them off the top of my head. Uh, if somebody jogs my memory, maybe I can uh, remember some of it. It's, uh, it's been a long time. And when you get my age, memory is not so good so let's just sign it off here and, and uh, uh, hope you boys in georgia and around enjoys it and uh, write down your questions and give them to scotty and uh, we'll beam it up scotty <laughs> thank you uh,